Well, good morning, Walden Church. Welcome back. Welcome home. It's good to see all of you. For 2022, we've begun a sermon series looking at the book of Matthew. Why? Well, because it's the beginning of the year, and I can't think of anything better to start your year off with than Jesus. Everything we do at this church should be about Jesus because we are his. Uh, Last week, we finished off chapter four, and I know you're excited about moving forward, but I wanted to go back to the bottom of chapter four just one more time and kind of remind ourselves what it said. In verse 23, it says, Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. So following this, we have chapters 5, 6, and 7, and Matthew uh, gives us the Sermon on the Mount, and this would be Jesus' teaching, right? And at the end of chapter 4, Matthew does summarize, and he says, after he calls his disciples, he teaches. And then Matthew comments that Jesus healed every disease and every affliction among the people. So naturally, we would assume that if Matthew says, that's where I'm going with this book, then in Matthew 8, we would shift from teaching to healing. And that's what we see. Matthew's book is not in chronological order. It's, it's topical. He's grouping teaching together, and he groups healing together. In fact, look at how Matthew finishes the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7. He sets you up for what's coming. Verse 28 says, And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Matthew summarizes Jesus' greatest teaching, right, by saying, Jesus' teaching had authority. So now we begin chapter 8. And what do you think Matthew will try to show us? Perhaps Jesus' authority in the world, in his healing. Or better yet, his authority over uh, all of the physical world. We need that, don't we? Right now our world is inflicted with sickness and disease and darkness. I I know we're all thinking about COVID right now, but COVID has been a nice little distraction from cancer. Every year in the United States, more than 1.6 million people are diagnosed with cancer, and nearly 600,000 people die from it, making it the second leading cause of death. And if I asked you to raise your hand, If you or someone you knew had cancer or who has died from cancer, we would all raise our hands. And cancer is not going away. Approximately 5.7 million people in the U.S. currently have Alzheimer's disease. The number of Americans with Alzheimer's is projected to triple to 16 million by 2050. And Alzheimer's is not a disease of old age. 200,000 people under the age of 65 have early onset Alzheimer's disease. Worldwide, about 50 million people have some form of dementia, and someone in the world develops dementia every three seconds. It certainly doesn't seem like Alzheimer's is going away. And when sickness hits and trials and tribulations hit, when you and I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we worry and we pray. Today we're going to read several stories in Matthew chapter 8 of people who are walking that path of shadow and death. And we're going to see what they do and what Jesus does. Starting at the top of the page, verse 1. When Jesus came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately... His leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift 
that Moses commanded for a proof to them. First, we see Jesus cleanses the physically unclean. This is good news. Good news for people with COVID. Good news for people with cancer. Amen? Does Jesus have the authority over disease? Yes, he does. But we always need to ask, how do we make this story apply to us today? What does the leper understand here that's important for us to understand? Well, Jesus acts on his own prerogative. The choice to heal is still Jesus. The leper asks, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And you know, there's a lot of people who say that health and healing are owed to Christians and that we can almost demand that God relieve us from suffering. But the problem is I never see that from anyone who comes to Jesus for healing. Just like this leper, they come asking and hoping and praying and believing and sometimes even begging, but never demanding. In fact, I think this man with leprosy displays the perfect attitude when coming to Jesus. He says, Lord, I know you are able to do this, but will you? God's purposes, they're beyond me. I don't understand how my suffering works. I don't know how it fits all into his plan, but that doesn't mean I ever doubt his power. And I don't ever doubt his love for me. Maybe you're fighting a disease or a sickness in your own body, or or maybe it's not even you, maybe it's your spouse. There are some things you can learn from this story about how God heals. First, look at how the leper comes to Christ. He knew that Christ had power to heal him, and so he came and first worshipped him. He says, Lord, right? Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Notice the leper prays for the will of God. So we should come humbly to Christ, because all things come from God, and all things are sustained through God, and all things lead to the glory of God. Therefore, God owes us nothing. God owes us nothing ever. And so we come humbly and we say, Lord, if you so desire, I throw myself now at your feet. And if I die, I die. Jesus can heal. He has the power to heal. He has the authority to heal. But will he? Doesn't that mean that uh, you, you should never pray for a miracle? That's not what I'm saying. Miracles can still happen. Should you pray for miracles? Yes. But just remember the one who is able to heal you also had the power to save you in the first place, to keep you from experiencing this at all. Remember when we studied the temptation of Jesus in the desert, Jesus didn't even perform a miracle to save his own hunger. He had the power, but it wasn't his will. Rather, he told the devil that we needed to first seek God's will in all situations. So like this leper, we should always first pray for the will of God. But then don't miss how Jesus responds to the leper. He stretches out his hand and touches him. Leprosy was horrible and it was a nasty disease and Jesus touches him? I mean, back in 2 Kings, after the king of Israel tells Naaman that he can't heal him, Elisha calls for Naaman and tells him, go wash in the Jordan. But Jesus doesn't give the leper a a list of things to do to be cleansed. He simply speaks a word and touches him. Don't miss the beauty of this picture. The Old Testament told the Hebrew people that if you touched the sick, you would become sick. If you touched the unclean, you would become unclean. So touching suffering used to mean that now you suffer. But Jesus touches us and he takes our suffering and our sin upon himself. Friends, that's the picture of the cross right here. Even your own sins right now that you struggle with, that darkness, it makes you feel filthy. Jesus takes that on himself. Let's continue on in our story. Verse five. Then Jesus had entered Capernaum A centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. 
And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from the east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. You know, I think it's pretty safe to assume that the centurion had a lot invested in this servant. But the story also tells us something else. This servant was more than a slave. This was someone that the centurion's family probably deeply cared for. And they are probably both Gentiles, both the centurion and the slave. But this man had heard about Jesus, and it's a good thing he did, because one encounter with Jesus changes everything for him. And like the leper, the centurion has a very clear picture of who Jesus is. And Jesus makes a, a comment that a foreigner, a Gentile, right? He tells everybody, hey, the least likely person ends up understanding better than anyone else he's run into. He says, this guy understands just how far my authority reaches. He understands how it operates. And so we see Jesus heals the ethnically outcast. Did you notice that first Jesus offered to go to his house? Unheard of. Unheard of. A Jewish rabbi is volunteering to go to a Gentile's home where sick people are. Never. But notice what the centurion says. He says, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. And when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turning to the crowd that was following him, he said, I have never seen faith like this in all of Israel. The centurion displays humility and trust in the authority of Jesus. And he calls him Lord. He calls him Lord. Who is this guy? Doesn't matter. What matters is the story teaches us the lengths of Jesus' ability. He doesn't need to touch us physically to heal us like the first story. Just as God created the world with a word, Jesus heals with a word. And healing isn't reserved for only God's chosen people. Look at the next story, verse 14. And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand, the fever left her, and she rose and began to serve him. Again, Jesus touches and heals, and this time it's a woman. So he restores the culturally marginalized. Gilbert Bilzekian is an American Christian writer. He's a professor, he's a lecturer. Along with Bill Hybels, he's one of the co-founders of Willow Creek Community Church. He says the Gospels record several instances where Jesus reaches out to unnoticeable women, inconspicuous, silent sufferers who blend into the background and are seen by others as negligible entities designed to exist on the fringes of life. Jesus notices them, recognizes their need, and in one gloriously wrenching moment, he thrusts them on center stage in the drama of redemption with the spotlights of eternity beaming down upon them, and he immortalizes them in sacred history. <clears throat> and all three synoptic gospels record this story. Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law. Jesus comes to Peter's house. He saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. But with this story, something very unique happens. Quite often, after being healed, people leave Jesus and they go about their normal lives. Peter's mother-in-law, however, immediately rises and begins to serve him. Matthew takes a pause here in all of these healing stories, and he makes an observation for us. He says, That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. And this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illness and bore our diseases. Matthew quotes Isaiah chapter 53. 
And he does that to explain what he's written. He does that to explain what's going on so far. And that should make us ask, well, what is Isaiah 53 all about? Isaiah 53 is about the cross. Isaiah 53, verse 3 says, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Does being a Christian save you from disease? No. Does being a Christian spare you from suffering? No. We just read, even Jesus suffered. That is not the point of Jesus' ministry. The point of his ministry was not to save you from suffering, it was to save you from sin. The point of Jesus' ministry was the cross. And the point of the cross was to overcome sin. Yes, before sin, there was no suffering. That is true. The Bible says we have suffering and sickness and death because of sin. They go hand in hand. But Jesus did not come to take away our suffering. He came to take away our sin. So in this life, you will still suffer. You will still get sick. You will still die. Being a Christian does not save you from any of that. Heaven will save you from that. But that is one day. That is not this day. In fact, the Bible says of suffering, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. How many? All. <laughs> right? All. Does being a Christian save you from COVID, from cancer, from Alzheimer's, from death? No, only from sin. Yes, one day we'll, we will be saved from pain and death. And we look forward to that day. Paul says, for this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. He calls this world a momentary affliction. I know your darkness and your trial doesn't seem very momentary right now, does it? But it is compared to heaven, compared to the heaven that awaits you. Look at the next story. Now, when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up to him and said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Do you remember the story that we read last week? Jesus called the 12 disciples, right? And they left everything and they followed. They left health. They left wealth. They left prosperity. They left security. They didn't even know where they were going. But they knew who they were going with. And here in Matthew 8, Jesus doesn't seem to be taking any more followers. In fact, he's actually turning followers away. Why? What's the difference between his disciples and the ones who are asking to follow right here? Well, notice what Jesus says. He says, if you follow me, you can actually lose it all. Jesus says, I don't even have a house. And you want to follow me? Do you know what this means? Have you considered the cost? He says it with his own lips, doesn't he? We need to know the cost of being a disciple. The 12 disciples left dead-end jobs. They left a life of toil, a life of being hated to follow Jesus, and they didn't care. See, that's the difference. They didn't care to leave their old life behind, even if it meant being homeless, even if it meant not knowing where their next meal was going to come from. But these new people who want to follow, they don't seem to want to follow if it means they have to give certain things up. Don't listen to any teacher who tells you that being a Christian means that you won't get sick. 
or that you won't suffer. In fact, the next story here in Matthew 8, we often read this at funerals. The story is read when people face suffering. Verse 23, and when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him, and behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep, and they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this that even the winds and sea obey him? See, there is a great analogy here. There is. There's a great analogy here about how Jesus calms the storms of our lives. But that's an analogy. Tell me something. Do the disciples here in this moment step back and go, wow, this is a really beautiful analogy. (laughs) Is that why they're so amazed? No. They see the physical reality that a man just told nature what to do and nature listened. They marvel because they realize that God is in the boat with them. The point of the story is not storms in your life will end. Jesus will end the storms of your life. I can't promise that your cancer will go away. I can't promise that your husband will be cured of Alzheimer's. I can't promise that your marriage will get better. Jesus does not promise to calm your storms. And what the story does teach us, though, is that in the midst of the storm, the point is, you are not alone. You are not alone. You will have trials, you will have wind, you will have waves, you will have disease, you will have darkness, and you will have death. Psalm 23 is also read at funerals. Does Psalm 23 say that you will not suffer? No. It says the opposite. Verse 4 says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, present tense, right? Present tense. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Also present tense. Storms come, suffering comes. Jesus will never leave. Jesus has authority over one more thing. Matthew 8 records it right here at the end. And when he came to the other side to the country of the Gerasenes, two demon-possessed men met him coming out of the tombs, so fierce that no one could pass the way. And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a herd of many pigs was feeding at some distance from them, and the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, send us away into that herd of pigs. And he said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. The herdsmen fled. And going into the city, they told everything, especially what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. What do we see Jesus have authority over? The supernatural world. Jesus has commands even over the demons. You know, Satan can do nothing in this world. And his demons can do nothing in this world. Notice that these two demons, they don't fight back, (laughs) right? They see Jesus and they go, "I, I quit, right? They just give up. And then, this is hilarious, this is absolutely hilarious, they tell Jesus how to punish them, (laughs) right? You and I live in a world of evil. We live in a world of suffering. We live in a world of pain. And as a result, We spend a lot of our time living in fear. And we question, what's going to happen now? What next? What's the point of Matthew chapter 8? The whole chapter. What's the point of it? What's our takeaway? 
Jesus has authority. Remember at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew said people marveled at Jesus' teaching because he taught as one with authority. And then Matthew shifts over to the physical world and the spiritual world. And he says Jesus has authority even over that. Right? I want to close with a passage from the book of Joel. Joel 2 says, Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. You know what the last thing you want to hear when you're going through something terrible in your life? The last thing you want to hear is someone who comes up to you and and says, Hey, cheer up. Things aren't that bad. Hey, grumpy face. Turn that frown upside down. And I'm sure the people in Joel's day, they felt a lot like that when Joel says, don't be afraid. Because the people in Joel's day were facing a plague of locusts that had destroyed all the crops. And now the people were starving. And Joel says, fear not, rejoice. What are you talking about, Joel? I don't know how I'm going to feed my kids and you're telling me not to be afraid? I've lost everything and you're telling me to be happy about it? I mean, God has done great things. If this is an example of great things that God has done, I don't want any part of God. No, thank you. Have you ever felt like that? Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you didn't get that promotion that you deserved. Maybe your doctor told you the news that no one ever wants to hear. Maybe you lost a child. Maybe you lost a spouse. Maybe you lost a parent. Maybe life has smacked you in the face with things and your hopes and dreams didn't go the way you thought they would. These past two years, we've had our own locust invasion, haven't we? Jobs are disappearing. Food isn't on the shelf. Commodities are hard to find. People are getting sick. Local businesses are closing left and right. Can you imagine if a short but very attractive pastor from Walden Church took a bullhorn, walked into the middle of Walmart, and said, don't be afraid, everyone. Be glad. Rejoice. Why? Because the Lord has done great things. How is it possible to not be afraid in times like these? How is it possible to be glad and rejoice when the world around us seems to be falling apart? The only way it's possible is because God has promised to do great things. And here's the beautiful thing that I want you to notice about this. God says they're already done. He's already done them. God has already accomplished and done great things. And we haven't even experienced them yet. So because of that, we need to rejoice. We need to be glad and rejoice because God has promised to provide. God has promised to never leave us. So when in Matthew 6, during the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, not about your body, what you will put on. God is passionately zealous for you. He wants to take care of you. Now, does that mean that you will uh, never experience a moment without? No. I mean, there were times even in the Apostle Paul's life when he was hungry and hurt and cold, and he was begging Timothy, send me coats, send me books. Jesus even says of himself, I don't even have a pillow. Maybe you're not content with the circumstances that God has you in right now. Maybe you're resting in the fact that he is passionately zealous for you, though. He has promises for you. Can you rest in that fact? Can you rest in the fact that he is providing for you? No matter what. Even though you suffer. Even though you walk through the valley, he is providing for you and he has not left you. No matter what is going on in your life, be glad and rejoice. How? How can we be glad and rejoice? 
because our king has the authority over all things and he will make all things right and he promises to never leave us. And you know what? That's even how Joel ends his message to his own people. They are starving and he says, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of your Lord, your God, who has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord, your God, and there is none else and my people shall never again be put to shame. God is promising these people. He says, you are my people, I promise. I am your God, I promise. And he promises that through it all, he will be with them. He will be in the boat with them. He will walk their streets. He will go to their homes. He will touch them. He will draw them close because that is who he is. What a glorious picture. What a glorious promise. And it's the same promise. It's the same promise and the same good news that Matthew begins his whole book with. In the Christmas story, Matthew 1.23 says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. John repeats it. John repeats it in his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he follows that in verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ, God incarnate, God the Son, came to fulfill a promise. And that promise was a relationship. Not with a group of people, with everyone. Not with lepers, Not centurions, not slaves, not Gentiles, not women, everyone. You, me, everyone. He came to be with us through all the junk that you are going through right now. He came so that you could be with him in forever and in glory. Jesus came to restore your brokenness. He came to give you new life. He came to protect you from evil. And he provides for you. He provides for you abundantly. Above all, above more than you would ever think, make no mistake about it, in Christ, God has done great things. Rejoice and be glad. And when you have a real relationship with him, you can be glad and you can rejoice because he has done great things for you. Do you have a real relationship with Jesus this morning? You can. All you have to do is ask. He's already done great things. He's already paid that price. The cross is behind us. All you have to do is believe in him. Turn from your sin. Trust Jesus as your Lord. Surrender your will to him. Confess to him. Submit to him. Leave it all behind. Drop everything and immediately follow him passionately because he passionately pursues you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the Gospels, not just for Matthew, but for all of them, because they wonderfully teach us the life of your Son. They give us these beautiful stories. He is so great, and we are so privileged to be his children, to have his love, to be washed in his grace. Lord, may every day of our life be spent in pursuance of him, following him. May we learn from his teaching. May we model his healing. We are all walking through suffering right now. And at one point or another, we will all suffer again in the future. But we have Jesus. Thank you that he is in the boat with us. Lord, there is a world out there that does not know it. They cannot see it. They don't believe it. There is only a little time left. There is but seconds left in all of eternity. May your church work all the harder to tell this world 
not to be afraid because their king is in the boat with them and their king has the authority over all things. We thank you and praise you. And we give all of this back to you in your son's name. Amen. Hey, I want to thank you for joining us this morning. It's so good to see you. But of course, we'd love to see you right here. We are open every Sunday. Uh, We love you guys, and we'd love to have you here with us. We want to see you again. We want to shake your hand. We want to hold you. We want to hug you. Uh, We have two services every single Sunday. The first one is at 9.30. We have a choir, and we sing traditional hymns, the ones that you grew up with, the ones that you love. We have an 11 o'clock service, which is more contemporary. Come casual, come in jeans. Uh, you don't have to dress up. We just, we're just happy to have you. We have a worship team. During that hour, we also have a children's program and we have youth. We have a youth group that meets every Wednesday as well. If you've got a son or daughter who's in sixth grade through high school and they're sitting around bored on a Wednesday, you can send them on over. They, you, you don't have to belong to our church to be involved in our youth group. Please take advantage of our youth group. It's a great Uh, group. There's like 30, 35 kids. They all live in the neighborhood. Send them over on their skateboard or their bike. We will even feed them dinner and we'll send them home to you in about an hour and a half. I love you guys. I'll see you soon. Bye.